you don't mind, I'd like to just add another prayer for my presentation. Could you borrow that? Loving Father, once again, we ask for your guidance, your instructions, your spirit to teach us and to help us to understand what you're trying to say to us. Hide me behind the cross. May your people see the scripture and Jesus. <coughs> so be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and verse 15. That video was on this morning too? No. No. No, right? Yeah, let's keep it that way. No. <laughs> I don't have, uh, oh. I don't have PowerPoints. Please, can, could you turn that off? I get it. I'm sorry. Is that okay? <laughs> Just, uh, there are a few reasons why. I like to have eye contact. Amen. I know my eyes are small, but we can still have eye contact. <laughs> chapter 24 and verse 15 we're looking at another prophecy this time Jesus is giving us this prophecy in fact very good I'm usually not a PowerPoint person no notes no PowerPoint just old-fashioned style I like to use whiteboard though. <laughs> whiteboard. <laughs> All right. Uh, Matthew, 15, uh, Matthew 24, verse 15, it says this. You there? Yes. It says, When ye therefore shall. Uh, next word, please. See, again, pay attention to action words. Okay? So, when ye shall what? See, see what? The abomination of desolation doing what? Doing what? Abomination, desolation doing what? Stand. Okay, stand where? In the holy place, which was spoken of Daniel. So, here Jesus gives reference to the book of Daniel. So if, since Jesus gave a reference to the book of Daniel, I'm sure the book of Daniel is okay. What do you say? Alright. So, Jesus said, if you see something, so because Jesus said, if you see, if you see this, when you see this, that means abomination of desolation is something that you can see. Yes or no? Yeah? I mean, you may think, oh, that's symbolic. Okay, okay, you may have a point there. But at least the Bible says, when you see this, physically, you see the abomination of So, what do we know about abomination of desolation? It's something that you can see. And the Bible says, abomination of desolation, doing what? Stand. Therefore, abomination of desolation is something that it can stand. And in this case, particularly speaking, it is standing where? Holy, Holy place. place. So when you see this, doing this, do that. What is that? Verse 16. It says, Then, see that word then? 
If you see this, then do this. Let him which be in Judea, next word please, another action word. What's the word? Flee into the mountains. So let me just make it really simple for you. Verse 15, if you see, verse 16, flee. See, flee, you like that? Okay. So if you see this, you got to flee. All right. I'm going to write this one. I hope you can see this. Otherwise, I think they may have some binoculars though. Can you read that? Oh. <laughs> huh? It's very light. Oh. Well, by faith, believe me, I wrote abomination. Okay? Of desolation. Standing in the Holy Spirit. But the biggest, uh, in this case, obviously the main focus is what is abomination of desolation? And what does it mean when the Bible says stand in the holy place? So what is abomination of desolation and where is holy place? Now, when you are trying to understand this, just reading Matthew 24, it is going to be pretty difficult. Thank God, teachings of Jesus were recorded not only by one disciple, Matthew, but many other disciples. And he was not among the twelve, but he was there. One thing is for sure, he received what Jesus said. I'm backtracking just a little bit. But anyhow, we have the record of the teaching of Jesus, not only in one place, but other places in the gospel. Yeah. Just to give you a quick example, do you remember what was written above the head of Jesus when he died on the cross? The king of the Jews. Jews. You are wrong. Or may I say, you are incomplete. The king of the Jews, I believe that is in Matthew. No, that is in Mark. Luke, it says, this is the king of the Jews. You forgot the this is. <laughs> And you say, oh, you're making a big fuss. Yeah, I'm kind of making a big fuss. To give an example. And when you go to other places, it has additional information. It says, so when you put everything together, then you have a complete answer. When you put it together, you have, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That is a complete answer. But you will not get that complete answer from one book. So you have no choice but to use Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Are you following what I'm trying to say? Yes. In the same way, you've got to do the same thing with this particular text in Matthew. 24, 15. Okay? So what I need to do right now I need to go to other books in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to look for the same thing. Are you listening? Yes. That can give me additional information. Yes? yes? Okay. But I have to find first the right match. Yes? Yeah, yeah. I cannot just choose anything. But here is the right match that gives me additional information. So turn your Bibles now with me to the book of Luke. 
Book of Luke. Luke 21. Are you there? All right, here we go. Luke 21 and verse 20. See, it, it still works really well without the PowerPoint, huh? I get you to do more work. <laughs> Since you have the Bible. Um, here we go. Verse 20, the Bible says, and next word, please. When ye shall, next word, see. Similar beginning. Yeah? With Matthew 24, 15. Then read verse 16. Oh, sorry, sorry. Verse 21. Then let them which are in Judea, next word, please, flee. Do we have basically the same format? Yes or no? Yes. If you see this, you've got to flee. Right. But remember in Matthew uh, 24, 15, when you see what? Abomination of desolation. Standing in the holy place. Holy place. And we're trying to figure out what is the abomination of desolation? What does it mean to stand? And what does it mean? Holy place. So now you can pretty much begin to figure out the format of this weekend's presentation. Last night, I talked about when Michael is going to stand, yeah? And this afternoon, we're talking about when abomination of desolation is going to stand. So we're, we're comparing two different standing. So here we go. But when you look at this Bible text, again, it's very difficult to figure out what, 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 I mean, what is it, what is this talking about? But when you look at Luke, we, found, we have found, found the right match. And in Luke, you see what? Verse 20. And when ye shall see, what? Jerusalem. Next word, please. Compass. With what? Compassed with armies. Jerusalem compassed with armies. Then know that the desolation thereof is near nigh. When you see this, then you got to what? Flee. The flee part is the same thing, right? So that's not a big problem. But now we're trying to figure out abomination of desolation. In Matthew 24, 15, abomination of desolation stand in the holy place. But in Luke, Jerusalem, compassed with on. Okay. And Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, know that what is near? What is near? Desolation. Is that really hard to understand? Is it? And most likely, desolation is near because army is, army is there, right? Armies are there, right? So who is, so based upon that contextual setting, who is most likely doing the work of desolation? Armies. Armies. Yes? Okay. So then, in Matthew 24, 15, abomination of desolation, We can say desolation is connected to armies. Yes or no? Yes. 
Is that just, fair, logical, sensible? Yes. Are you with me? Yes. So our knees are connected to desolation. And that makes a perfect sense. Why? Because, look, I mean, listen, our means, what is their job description? Basically, to kill, to destroy, yeah? So that makes perfect sense. Okay, so then, abomination, so, so then, desolation is somehow connected to our means. Therefore, abomination is somehow connected to desolation, yes or no? Yes. Because the Bible says abomination of, of desolation. Meaning abomination belongs to who? Oh, yeah? <clears throat> You're not too sleepy for you to think now. Are you? No. Okay. So then, okay, alright. Desolation? Our means. But this abomination belongs to them. So what abomination? is connected to our needs. All you have to do, all you have to do, study the word abomination in the Bible. That's all you have to do. If you do that, you have, you, you, you are going to get so many different uh, descriptions and definitions for Abomination. I'm just making more room so I can walk. Um, and when you do that, you are going to discover there are many things that many things that God says abomination. By the way, abomination means things that are disgusting in the sight of God. That's what it means. Okay. And there are many things that are considered, according to the Bible, abomination. But, the list is like this. Out of many, one of them, it, one of them is idols. What did I say? According to the Bible, idols are considered abomination. Why do I mention this to you? Because of this. When we are talking about armies, and when Jesus said armies come passing Jerusalem, we are talking about Roman armies, yes? Okay. So when you consider Roman armies, did you know that when they go to a war, they bring pagan idols? Have you ever seen them carrying a long stick? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's look like that. Yeah, it looks like that, um, like, that flag. Not the flag, but what's on the top? Eagle. In fact, Roman soldiers, uh, by the way, historians have compared the similarities between Roman Empire and America. Non, I, uh, and this was done by, not based on Christian premises, but just historians they have discovered. There are so many things that are very similar between the old ancient empire, Roman Empire, with modern day empire, America. Okay. But anyhow, it looked look like that. Okay, and back in those days, Roman surgeons they carried these uh, long sticks with these uh, images on top, and these images are sometimes like an eagle, or dragon, or Caesar's face, or a hand. These represent the gods of Roman Empire. Yes. Why do they do this? Are they weapons? They like scare people with the images of dragon. What would they do with them? Why did they bring these kind of things? Why? Because they're saying, we come in the name of our, our God, our pagan gods. We conquer you in the name of our God. You understand? 
So for the Jewish people, when they see those idols, they call it what? Abomination. But guess who is holding them? Army. And what are they doing? What, what, what are they going to do when they come? Destroy. So, armies with these idols, abomination of desolation. Are we together? Is that too hard? No, right? You can, you can understand that, right? Okay. So, abomination of desolation is really armies with those idols. Okay. But the next part is a little more difficult. A little more difficult. Abomination of desolation stand in where? The holy place. When you think of holy place, um, what kind of locality, location do you uh, think? Sanctuary and temple, right? The temple of God. Okay. Again, I love to ask you a simple question. If you say sanctuary, okay, sanctuary, in Jerusalem or outside of Jerusalem, why do you hesitate? Sanctuary, where was it? In Jerusalem or outside? In Jerusalem. If you are doubting my words, just go to the back of your Bible. There's a little map. If you have those Bibles, it will show you. It's in Jerusalem. Okay. So if you say, holy place is the temple in Jerusalem, that means abomination of desolation, Roman armies, yes? They're standing inside or outside? Inside. Yeah. If you say holy place is temple, it's inside. But in the book of Luke 21, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, question. When the Bible says Jerusalem being compassed with armies. So armies are inside or outside? Outside. Outside. For sure, right? Yes. So then, how do you understand which sign that Jesus was talking about? When you see the army inside, then run? Or when you see the army outside, then run? Which one? Outside. Or do you even understand the, the conflicting issue we're talking about here? Because many people believe that when the Bible says holy place, it's got to be inside. Because they're thinking temple. Okay. Then how do you determine which one's right? Do you believe that God, do you believe that Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem, uh, when you see armies in Jerusalem, run. And he said, when you see armies standing outside of Jerusalem, run. You think Jesus gave those two options? No. You think? No. no. I personally don't think so. But here's a deeper issue. Deeper issue, okay? And I'm dealing with, listen, I am dealing with how to study the Bible principle, okay? Here you have two Bible verses talking about same thing. That is for sure. However, you have to determine which one is more clear. Why? Because you have to use that which is clear to explain that which is unclear. Are you with me? Yeah? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Or do you think we should use that which is unclear to explain that which is clear? No. That doesn't make any sense, right? 
Yeah, remember that. You've got to use that which is clear to explain that which is unclear. And so then, between these two verses, which one do you think is more clear? Matthew 24 or Luke 21? The eager Bieber Bible students in the front, they usually sit in the front, they say, yeah, Luke 21. But I'm guessing maybe there are one or two, three or four, ten or twenty. <laughs> maybe you're thinking, I think Matthew 24, 15 is clear. It says they're standing in the holy place. Holy place is a holy place. And I think both of them are clear. Well, if you say both of them are clear, then we got a problem. Jesus, when are we supposed to run? They're inside or outside? Which one? I'm confused. Two choices? If you miss out running when they're outside, then you can still run when they're inside? Now, without using Bible support, without using Bible support, ladies and gentlemen, it will not make any sense to run away when they are inside. <laughs> yes or no? Yes. Right? Even when they're outside, it's, it's, it's hard to run away. But you have a more chance to run away when they're outside than inside. If the Roman soldiers are inside, please tell me what are the Roman soldiers doing inside of, in, in the city of Jerusalem? Are they having little uh, Jewish bagel hot dogs or uh, sandwiches? They have a schedule for killing? What are they doing? They're killing already, right? The city is already taking over, yes? And how can you run away? What are you going to do? Excuse me, i got to run. <laughs> can you move that sword to the left a little bit? That's, I, mean, I mean, without using the Bible basis, to me it doesn't make any sense. But some of you are still thinking, but the problem is, you're thinking, abomination of desolation, standing in the holy place? To me that sounds very clear. It sounds very clear to you because you're thinking, holy place has to be the temple. A building. Yeah? Okay, okay. Fine. But let me suggest this thought to you. According to the Bible, do we have any examples calling a place without the temple, without this building, without a structure, calling a place without a structure, building, temple, but God still called it holy place. Yes or no? Yes. Oh, there you go. There you go. And that example is where? Moses. Moses standing before the burning bush. God says, take your shoes off, just like the Asian culture. <laughs> Maybe God. <clears throat> it's good to take your shoes off. We Koreans do that. Anyhow, God said, take your shoes off, because the place you're standing is what? So God called a place without a temple? Holy place. So in the Bible, in the Bible, place can be called holy without a temple, yes or no? Yes. So then, holy place, this place is not clear, yes or no? Because it can be a ground or temple. You have two options, right? Because you have two options, that text is not clear. Give you like one, two, three seconds to think about that. Okay. Army, Jerusalem compassed with armies. The word compassed. What does that mean? Surrounded. Surrounded. Inside or outside? outside? Can you have any other options? No. No. Surrounded. Or are you like creating a spiritualistic, abstract 
weird technical definition of 21st century? Compass meaning inside. You little new age. It doesn't make any sense, right? So when you say compass, there's only one definition. Surround, outside, right? So then between these two verses, which one is more clear? Obviously, Luke 21 is more clear, right? So then you have to use this to explain that. Yeah? If we do that, then you have to say where are they standing in verse 21, uh, in Luke 21? Outside. Where are they standing in Matthew 24? Where? What's the place called? Holy place. Therefore, holy place has to be outside. And you're thinking, I've never heard that before. <laughs> because I never heard that, I'm not going to believe that way. That's totally up to you. <laughs> but you may be missing out something. Because you've never heard it before. So don't be like that, okay? Yeah. Let me give you some information about this. And you can think about it. And you're thinking, why is it the outside is called the holy place? Well. Listen, don't you know it doesn't matter inside or outside? Don't you know the whole place is called holy place? And you're thinking, how? Well, no, to begin with, Jerusalem is sitting on what mountain? <coughs> Mount Zion is called the holy mountain. The whole mountain is considered what? Holy. holy. And not only that, another name for that mountain, Mount Moriah. Moriah. And what happened on Mount Moriah? What happened to Mount Moriah? Some people were like, Mount Moriah? Mount Moriah sent? Huh? That's where Abraham offered up Isaac. Exactly. That's when God reconfirmed his covenant with Abraham. Did you know that? When God gave the covenant to Abraham in the beginning, it was good until Abraham made that mistake. So God gave Abraham another chance to reconfirm it. And the second time was greater test. Give your son. First test was, I give you life. I don't believe. I give you life. I don't believe. So God gave life. But through, the, you know, through his mistake. So second test, give me that life. <laughs> I gave it to you, now give it to me. So Mount, Mount Moriah, Abraham offered up his son Isaac. And for the Jewish people, that's a holy thing, yes? yes. Holy event. Sacred ground. I know what some people are thinking. You're thinking, yeah, I know, okay, Mount Moriah, Abraham offered up his son Isaac, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I'm sure Abraham didn't use the whole mountain to do that. Just a little spot somewhere on the mountain. Just a little, you know, little area called holy. I'm sure not the whole mountain. Well, 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 listen, listen. I don't know why it is this way, but in the Bible, it, is, it, 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 it seems like. Do you remember uh, Mount Sinai? God came on the Mount Sinai, yes? yes? And God was, so to speak, occupying on the top of Mount Sinai, right? Not the whole mountain. But God said, Block the borders of mountain, yes or no? Yes. Why? Because the whole thing became holy. Holy, exactly. Even the event took place a spot somewhere a mountain, but the whole mountain now becomes considered to be holy. holy. Exactly. Again, 
These are the reasons why Mount Zion, Mount Moriah, Holy Mountain. So when Roman soldiers bringing their idols, abomination, soldiers, desolation, standing on Mount Zion, glorious mountain, Mount Moriah, there actually doesn't matter inside or outside, they're standing holy place. Yes or no? See, that makes a perfect sense. There you go. So basically, let's put that in a very simple language. Jesus said, when you see Roman soldiers coming towards your city, and they're going to surround your city, okay, and you'll see them uh, uh, bringing their pagan Roman gods. When you see that, I tell you, when you see it, you better flee to the mountains. That's it. That, but he said it this way. And there's a reason why. But you know, have you ever wondered? Okay, thank you Jesus for that sign. I'm, I'm going to really listen to what you just said. Okay, so, so here are Christians living in the last day, I mean living in their last days, and they see, they see Roman soldiers coming. Oh, is that what Jesus talked about? Oh look, they're surrounding the city. Oh look, they got uh, the, the Roman pagan idols. Oh look, okay, that's a sign. Let's run. Right. Please. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's run. They're surrounding the city. How can you run? They're, sur they're surrounding the city. How can you run? You know what? Jesus gave that prophecy AD 31 and it was fulfilled AD 66 they came they surrounded the city they called that besiegement okay but for some reason I'm guessing there was another war, and they needed extra soldiers. So these soldiers came, but somehow they left. And then they came back again later, and then finally in AD 17, the, the Roman soldiers destroyed the city and they killed the people. So whatever Jesus said, he knew what he was talking about. He knew that they are going to come and leave and come back again. He knew. Jesus is good, isn't he? He knew. No. Okay. All right, then. Now the question is, what is this? What is this got to do for us? What is this? This already took place a long time ago, nearly 2,000 years ago. What benefit can I get from this prophecy? Well, when you read Matthew 24, clearly, and you just cannot do this for every prophecy, but Matthew 24, Jesus made it very clear, based upon the questions of the apostles, this particular prophecy has two applications. One for the destruction of Jerusalem and one for the end time. So this particular prophecy has a secondary meaning intended by Jesus. And what is that secondary meaning? Well, let's do some observing. Now, when I say secondary meaning, do you think I'm talking about someday in the future your church will be surrounded by soldiers? I am not talking about that. What am I talking about? Well, when we do this, um, sometimes we call this history repeats. 
And when, I say, when we say history repeats, we're talking about the major characteristics that we can observe safely, easily. And that is this. Listen. These two words, abomination of, abomination of, desolation. The word desolation, again, it was obvious that's connected to honor. Soldiers, armies. <coughs> Army is really <coughs> political power, yes or no? Yes. It's something political. Okay. Political. Okay. How about the word abomination? Do you think the word abomination is a uh, political terminology or is it religious terminology? It's religious. Yeah. Um, it's so religious, I mean, today, you cannot go to a jail for committing an abomination. Right? And, and we don't really, you know, anyhow, the word abomination is more <laughs> religious because it's connected to things that God hates. And in this case, because the idols. So what do you have? When Jesus said abomination desolation, look at the main major characteristics. They are desolation, something political. Abomination, something religious. And they are together. Are you listening? So in the future, we can look for a political power in connection to religious power. And we call this the union of church and state. So before they stand in the holy place, they have to come. Yes or no? They're come. So in the beginning, there's going to be, so to speak, political power upholding religious thing, connection between Church and state, coming, marching. Yes? And then they come to a point, they are going to stand. What does it mean, stand? To establish, exactly. We are here to? To conquer or control. You with me? We're going to take your land, take your place, and control you. Stand. That's their bodily action, yes? But it says, you're standing where? Holy place. Because when they're coming from really distance away, that's not a holy place, yes? But when they come near to the Jerusalem, on the mountain, is a holy place, yes? So first, union of church and state and then they will come closer and closer and closer and then they come to a point to to say now we are ready to conquer that which is holy control that which is holy you with me yes, yes. so in the future we can expect union of church and state and when they unite they are going to attempt to take over to control that which is considered to be holy. Are you following this reasoning? But there's more. Okay, so, it's some, so in the future it's something about church and state, something about taking over, taking over that which is holy, but there's more. And this gets a little more interesting. When they come around the city, did you know they don't just stand there? You know, soldiers, they don't say, okay, let's make a big circle, hold hands. You know? <laughs> and they're standing uh, you know, far enough so that the arrows cannot shoot them. Like, da 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 da, da. You know, they're not doing this. When they come and surround the city, you know what they do? 
they actually start to uh, making trenches. Trenches? What do you mean trenches? You have to dig a ground, right? Dig a ground around the city? What's that for? They start building fences. Did you know that? They put a fence. They put a fence. They're coming to do a, like a makeover or something? What's going on? What is this? They're putting fences around. What does that mean? They're what? Cutting off. So that nobody can go in and nobody can come out. And historically speaking, how long, they, how long do they usually stay there? Can you guess how long? A few weeks, yeah, a few weeks. They can stay from, I'm sure that there are some incidents where they stay for two weeks, maybe, maybe you're right. But usually, they, I mean, at least they are prepared to stay outside from three months to three years. That is the reason why, back in those days, cities, they usually have a reserve good enough for three years. But many times they don't have enough preparation. <coughs> Depends what time you're coming in. This is the reason why, when they cut off the life support, meaning no food can go in, So they wait on the sort of soldiers, enemy army is waiting there until they go hungry, they go crazy, and they start coming out. When they come out, I start looking for some, some, because they already ate all their supply in the city. They already ate everything, even the city doves. <laughs> if you're a dove back in those days in the city, I'm sorry. So they already ate everything in the city, and now they're being desperate, so they come out, and when they come out, soldiers, what do they do? And they're dead. And when they become so weak, then you just, boom, march in and destroy everybody. This is the reason why the Bible says, when this Jerusalem was besieged, people became so hungry, they were eating their own flesh. And I'm going to tell you something, this may be, this may not be PG-13, but the mothers and the people were actually eating their own babies. When you become so hungry, there's no moral value. Everything goes, only one thing, you gotta survive. It's terrible, isn't it? So then, let's break, break this thing down. Okay, this kind of thing, abomination of desolation, Roman soldiers, uh, surrounding a city, cutting off life support. This kind of thing, not that we're going to see literally uh, your house will be surrounded by soldiers or something like this. It may happen, but that's not, I don't think that's what the Bible is talking about. But it's got to be something about cutting off your life support. Yes or no? Yes. That's the tactic. That's the strategy when they come and surround the city. Yes? Uh, question. Back in those days, people lived in the city. How do they get their food? <coughs> How do they get their food? Uh, usually the farms are where? Inside or outside? Outside. Oh, so the food has to come from? Outside. So what do they do when, when the food comes? They just say thank you and just take the food? What do they have to do? Because they're in the city, they don't have their own farm, what do they have to do? They have to buy. Whoa, look at this. So when they did the besiegement, when they surround the city, guess what was not possible anymore? Buy and sell. 
then it makes perfect sense. In the future, it's going to be something about union of religious power with political power, and they're going to control that which is, take over that which is, conquer that which is, holy, but in the process, the way they're going to attack is to forbid you from buying and selling. Anything, something sounds similar ringing in your head? Ladies and gentlemen, may I suggest to you, abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place in the future. This is talking about the enforcing of the mark of the beast. Without the mark of the beast, you cannot buy and sell. This is the reason why I want to say to you, Open up your wallet. No, I'm, I'm serious. Open up your wallet. I'm not stealing. Come on, just open up your wallet. Take out the biggest bill that you have. What you got? Jackson? Who do you have? Hamilton? You got Ben? Well, you got Benjamin. Or you got George Washington. Who do you have? Who do you have? You got Benjamin? Yeah? You got, you got plastic. Fancy sleeve. <laughs> Look at your Benjamin Franklin $100 bill. And I say this many times in other camp meetings, in other meetings. According to this particular prophecy, in connection to the mark of the beast, time will come you cannot buy and sell. Which means, if you are going to stay faithful to God, your money has an invisible expirational date. When that day comes, I don't know when, but when that event takes place, that money is no good to you. So you better use it before it runs out. <laughs> and I'm not talking about Ontario Mills now. But then, there's something very interesting about this prophecy. Let me show you something. In, in Matthew, Let's go there quickly. I only got five minutes, I think. Actually, I already used up 25 minutes. Apology. Uh, but is it okay? Thank you. You had no choice. <laughs> um, Matthew 24. And I love the instruction that Jesus gave. Jesus gave a very good instruction. Jesus said, verse 16, it says, Then let them which be in what? Judea, Judea flee into the what? Mountains. Mountain. So, I mean, if you're really wise, I mean, if you're, if you're one of those Christians back in those days, you know this instruction before the event. Jesus said, when you see this, you better flee to the mountains. I mean, if you're thinking, you better have a place in the mountain. What do you say? Already prepared. So you can, bam, go, right? So that gives you a little bit of wisdom. But actually there's something even deeper than that. Let me show you something. So it's not about just having a place in a mountain. Which mountain? Big Bear, where are you going to go? <laughs> Which mountain? Um, there, are not, there are not that many mountains from here. Actually, on the advertising for this weekend's meeting, I saw whole California going into the water. But anyhow. Um, but what is interesting is this. Verse uh, 17, it says, Let him which is, it is on the what? House top not come down to what? Take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his 
I don't know how you feel about this, but don't you think that's kind of um, too extreme? I mean, I mean, if you use a logical sense, you're on the house top. You see the sign, yeah. And Jesus knows the armies will come, yeah, and they're going to leave. And sometime later, they will come back, which means at least, I mean, at least they have about a month. A time, or more, maybe a little bit less, but at least, I mean, if I, if I go a little bit extreme, at least they have one day, you know what I mean? How many minutes do you need to come down from the, the housetop to grab some few clothes? I mean, unless you have so many clothes you want to take the shoes. But in order to survive and escape, I mean, it doesn't take much time, right? And if you know this instruction, you can easily prepare a bag, yes or no? Right? Or if you want to go like, gung ho about this, carry a backpack all the time. <laughs> right? You know, when I was in China, because I was doing some illegal stuff, not, not selling drugs, uh, <laughs> teaching Bible, underground secret, you know, without their permission. So, and I heard that the police can come like 3 a.m. in the morning, so I was always ready to run. So my bag is always ready, it's right next to my bed. It's already, it's, my bag is always packed. So the time to run, grab it, bam, you're gone. So you can do something like that, right? Only maybe, house top, come down, grab your stuff, boom, 15 minutes top. So you can, you can have a little discussion with Jesus. Jesus, I mean, you know, I mean, come, come on. Yeah. We've got at least you know, one, two, one month, but extra 15 minutes. This is a no-no. <laughs> I mean, why come you're so extreme? You're in the field. How far is this place, this field? It can be far, but it's not a whole day of journey. I'm sure you can come back and grab some stuff and go, right? What's wrong with this? We've got to survive. You can argue with Jesus this way, right? <laughs> but I don't think, I don't, because when you read it, it sounds like, the house is on fire, just run! Don't worry about you only have underwear, just run! It almost sounds like that, right? Yes. It's like panicking. It's, they're here. You run, run for your life, right? No, I don't. I don't think so. I, I, I don't think so. I don't think Jesus gave a panicking prophecy instruction. I don't think so. You know what Jesus is saying? Practically, practically speaking, I believe in the last days, it's okay to have a very systematic operation. And there, and there will be some time. But I believe what Jesus is saying is this. When you see the final sign, your heart, your mind, is so ready. You are willing to leave your earthly possessions without a second thought. Yeah. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you thinking? In other words, we can enjoy earthly things today. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. You can love your cereal bowl and your dish. That's fine. You can kiss it tomorrow morning if you want to. You can commit a sin, not worshiping the bull. Okay, you're not doing that. <laughs> I understand. You can appreciate your car. Nice Korean Hyundai. That's fine. <laughs> it's okay. You can enjoy. But what Jesus is saying, do not put your heart in those things. Amen. Because we can become possessive. Yes. 
And sometimes this feelings of possession is not altogether evil. But in a time of quick, fast, spiritual decision, those things can drag you down. Yes or no? Yes. So you, can, you may enjoy the things that God has given to you, but your mind is always ready, always prepared to detach from them without a second thought. That preparation is, my friend, and needs to happen right now. Amen. How? You pray like that every day. Amen. Thank you, O oh Lord, for all the things that you have given to me. But God, if you decide to take away everything from me, even my life support, I will still trust in you. Amen. This is a preparation for the second coming of Christ. Yeah. Let me give you a few examples. You remember Jesus said, remember lost wife? Yes. Jesus said, remember. You know what that means? You want to forget. <laughs> remember lost wife. What about her? I mean, we should be we should thinking of something more positive than negative, right? But Jesus said, think about the negative thing. In this case, remember, intellectually, spiritually, remember, lost wife. What about her? She looked back. Why did she look back? Because she wants to see how awesome the power of God, His judgment is upon the wicked Sodom. She looked back like, dun, 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 you deserve it, you wicked. <laughs> what made her turn? What made her, made her neck muscles to go like this? What? Her love for the city of Sodom, but especially some of you, you may not come to you may not come to like me after this. That's fine. I love you. <laughs> but she turned back because she misses her house. And I'm not I'm not going I'm not playing this gender thing, okay, please. But she turned back. Why? She's like all oh, my furnitures. <laughs> my balcony. All my china dishes. Are you are you listening? Yes. My walk-in closet. <laughs> All my sodomite shoes. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm trying to, trying to illustrate to you? She turned around with, because of things that are, I mean, to be honest, I mean, maybe there are some evil things that she was missing, but including the evil things, she was missing the simple, innocent things of life. She turned back because she cannot detach herself from those earthly things that are going to make her life comfortable. Why Asians and other countries, Korea from Philippines, why do we come here? Because we want to live comfortable life. It's so hard to walk 30 minutes to get water and come to the house. <laughs> and it's so hard to turn the faucet and you have to boil it all the time. <laughs> it is so difficult when you go to the toilet. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> I've been to the Philippines while I was there. <laughs> and I said, where's the toilet paper? <laughs> 
there was a little can with water inside. I said, no way, Jose. Now, listen, listen, at the same time, at the same time, I am not saying righteousness by living a life in jungle of Philippines. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying it's a sinful thing to have, you know, nice bed for your back. It's okay. It's okay to enjoy. But the mindset, the mindset to be able to let, let them go, this, it doesn't happen overnight. Lot's wife, her body was outside. She fled, but her mind never left. Are you following? Yes. And don't you know, the book of Job is the end time message. Don't you know that? Because when the New Testament talks about Job, you know when the Bible talks about Abraham, faith, or David, strength, courage, Solomon, wisdom, right? Yes. Esther, boldness, yeah? Samson, you know, um, his strength for God. We have these different characteristics of different people, right? Job, you know what the Bible says? Patience. Job, patience. Job, he lost everything. His food, his farm, his house, his furniture, his children, everything. And what made it worse, his wife said, curse God and die. Yes. I think at that time it would be better for her to be dead than to be alive and say things like that to him. Job lost everything. And he needed to learn this lesson to say, God, though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. Yeah. Patience. And the book of Revelation says, here are the patience of the saints. So when Jesus said, when you see the sign, flee. Don't go back to your house to take your clothes. Don't go back to your house. What's the message? Are you be, the message is be prepared to leave all your things that you need to make your life comfortable and to survive. Just what you need to do. Detach yourself from earthly things and truly be able to practice depending on God. Amen. That is a better preparation for the last days than to make sure you have a nice hideout somewhere. I don't mind hideout if you can't pay for it. <laughs> but if you cannot get a hideout, you better hide in Jesus, what he said. Yeah. And Jesus made it clear, when you see this sign, time will come. No more buying and selling. I'm sorry. No more Walmart. <laughs> no more shopping. No more just go around and live a regular life. Things will become difficult. Today, when things go a little difficult, we get irritated, frustrated, agitated, and we get angry. Last things. Many things will go wrong. People will betray you. People will reject you. You'll be threatened. They'll hate you. You lose everything. But can you still sing? As long as I have Jesus, I have everything. Amen. Are you
you making that part of your character? Character means is habitual. Habitual means you do it so many times. So many times means it is your daily routine. Daily routine means you purposely make decision again, again, and again. So are you willing to make that decision today? How many of you, you want to be ready for Jesus to come? Amen. If you do, please stand. I want to make a special call. There are some of you, you have things in your life you know for sure holding you back. You cannot be detached from it. What is it? Only you know. You know God knows. Can you imagine a day when Jesus comes back? God's people are going to float. They're going to fly. But can you imagine? I'm, I'm, I'm imagining, but can you imagine you're about to go up, but you're being pulled back? And you realize that your, your ankle is chained to the earth? And you, said to your, you say to yourself, I thought I cut everything. But then there's still one attached. Your mind was not ready. So he jerks you back, makes you turn around. You know the Bible says, we came into this world naked, we go away naked. It's a beautiful principle, isn't it? So how many of you this evening? It's not for everyone. If you have something in your life, you know it's so difficult for you to let go, but you know you have to let it go, mentally or literally physically, whatever it may be. If you need that mercy of God and the grace of Jesus, please come to the front. And let's pray together. Thank God. And many times, you know, usually revivals and, you know, reformation, this kind of meeting, people usually call for, you know, give up your drugs, drinking, you know, worldly entertainment, including all that. Tonight, I want to challenge you, even innocent things, and I'm not saying you should give them up per se, but your mind is not there. Your mind is on heavenly things. Your mind is not in your work. And you say, I'm not, my mind is not with my work, but if you look at your schedule, your mind is in your, your mind is in your work. You work all day long. And when you come home, you're too tired to read the Bible and pray. And you do that every day. And when you come to the church on Saturday, because you're so exhausted and tired, you're sleeping when the pastor is preaching. Your mind is not on things from God. If you need to reduce time, change, whatever, listen, my friends. This world is so disappointed. Okay, but we can stay positive. 
because Jesus lives today and is coming back. So today's, tonight's commitment, you're committing yourself to practice. Practice what? Lord, you can take everything. May I even challenge you to say, even to take away my family in this world. Because that's what happened to Job. But Lord, but my commitment to you, my faith to you, please help me to be connected with you. Help me to be so attached to you. Is that what you want? Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, the Bible is so true. It describes the end time events with these prophetic languages that we can understand. And our hearts are being stirred and we are awakened to realize the true preparation for your coming is really to love you with our hearts. And Father, to, to be honest and to be real with you, it can be so difficult and hard sometimes. Because naturally we want to survive and enjoy. And I, I know that you understand we need to survive and enjoy life. But perhaps tonight you're telling us in the midst of surviving, in the midst of enjoying your life, your heart, our heart, needs to be in heaven. Our treasure should be in heaven, not in the things of this world. So Lord, tonight, there are many that are standing here tonight, those of who came forward. They're asking your extra mercy and your grace that they may have, they may have the experience of this miracle of detaching themselves mentally or some physically from the things that are holding them back. Thank you, Father. Teach us to believe. 